Next, I would like to invite up our champion of the CCAA. <laughs> Dan Silas from Cardinal will be, will be giving a Habitat in Action update from the working group on the modern CCAA. Dan is a senior consultant on vegetation management, environmental compliance, and conservation projects. All right, uh, we're good now. It was a nice, uh, it was a great place to have a meeting. So, I mean, UIC is nice and all, but I mean, how many people can do it? Yeah, so to, to kind of build on, you know, what Sergio was, was talking about, uh, a lot has happened since we last got together in a room together in February. So, I want to talk a little bit about that, what, what happened. Um, what is the agency CCAA and where we're going from there? So, you know, if you go back to February, right, it's kind of like what you were saying, it's, you know, we were on the cusp. That June deadline was looming. So, you know, June is coming. And we were getting ready to uh, have a listing uh, decision, have the CCAA finalized, start rolling people. We were giving up all sorts of things to make that happen. Uh, May, we had our how to enroll webinars. So, Walking through the application and requirements to get enrolled in the CCA. Uh, those are out online. You can still look at those, which is still logical. Um, so, yeah, we were doing in the, you know, in the public comment period, the listing decisions, and the CCA conversation. And then, you know, the big things happen. So, the listing decision was postponed until December 15th of next year, right? Which, like Sergio said, sounds like a long time, but it'll be here before you know it. Um, and then, in the meantime, too, there was the, uh, the rule updates to the Endangered Species Act. First time in, like, 45 years we made updates to the Endangered Species Act. Um, and that just happened a couple weeks ago. So, two major changes uh, from a, a regulatory standpoint that peripherally sort of impact what we do with the CCAA. Uh, I'll go about that here in a bit. Uh, we to this, right? We've had a summer, right? So, one of the main reasons for, a listing, for the listing decision delay was to uh, give her more time for monarch populations this year, right? I mean, for, if you remember the, the trend lines, monarchs have been trending downward. And then last winter with the eastern population, there was this you know, big jump up to six hectares. Where did that come from? And by all accounts, last year was sort of a gangbuster year for monarchs in terms of having just the right conditions they move throughout their, their uh, summer migration. Uh, Western populations, you know, they're still you know, really doing poorly. Um, and so that's the, uh, yeah. How you take into account you have a population boost on one side with a crash on the other side, and how do you weigh that in? So, the hope was let's get it this year, see how the, how the response to the population is there, and make a decision for next year. Uh, so, as far as how population is looking right now, uh, I started talking with Chip Taylor from Kansas State, who, if you were at the, the February meeting, he came to talk about. Monarch populations and sort of his model for evaluating those at that time. And so we uh, we we think then to see like okay where are we at? You know, it's late summer. The big fall migrations just getting ready to start. So where are the populations sort of stand? What's the projection as of right now? And so you know it sounds like it's been a pretty good summer across that northern tier where the bulk of the, the population uh, is sort of generated. So. 40 to 45 degrees latitude, you know, kind of Philadelphia, Chicago ish, north. And uh, it seems that you know, there's been some setbacks here and there, but overall, we think it could be a fairly good year for the Eastern population. He's taking around five hectares, a little bit lower than last year, uh, but still fairly strong. Uh, we'll say, you know, there's still that time the monarchs go from here, or from you know, the upper Midwest, the Northeast, all the way back down to Mexico. So. Uh, with some drier conditions in Texas, you know, some freak storms, things like that, a long way to go to get to overwintering grounds. So that still might change. You think it could be five, maybe a little bit less than that. So if we see there, on the western side, western population still is not looking good. Um, you, know, you know, those numbers were down like 99 percent of the historic norms, and they're still down there. Uh, the reports coming back to their monitoring of Monarch Watch and their season is that it's still not really. There's no, no, no signs of being a strong population. So uh, that's still looking pretty dire out west. Uh, and in the southwest, it's kind of inconclusive. There's some data that's looking uh, you know, 
fairly limited there as well. So again, future population might be a little bit strong, not as strong as last year. Western population is still uh, doing really good. Bad. So what does all mean to the CPA? Right? What's going on? Well, uh, the ESA rule updates. Those are big changes uh, that we, we saw. I'm just going to say big changes, lots of little changes. We actually go through the rule revision. Uh, it's lots of little things that sort of uh, have gotten incorporated into those final rule changes. Uh, there is already at least one legal challenge to those, those revisions. So we'll see uh, if that gets considered and if that delays the implementation of those. Those uh, rule revisions, which that's taken effect, I think September 23rd or 5th. And so if that gets uh, delayed due to some of the challenges, we'll see that. Uh, but I talked to, talk to several people in the service about those uh, the, the rule revisions, and the general consensus is that a lot of those revisions and changes are a lot of procedural things. A lot of our things that are sort of now codified that uh, have been ways that they've been implementing certain activities in different regions for a long time. And so the, the rule updates are really uh, sort of a way of codifying those changes and making that sort of the rule now for regions. So in that sense, it didn't like to change a whole lot from a practical standpoint. There's still uncertainty just because of the challenges, and uh, there's more that there's other changes potentially coming to. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But as far as the CCA goes, there's no changes that are directly affect the CCA itself. Um, you know, it's mostly in terms of listing criteria or listing factors and, and uh, analysis points, that type of thing. So for the CCA, um, there's nothing in here that really looks like it's going to affect sort of how that goes about. Uh, speaking of the listing itself, uh, as Sergio mentioned, the way this delay now that this is sort of the, the perfect window for the C for the CCAA now to provide that upfront conservation. And that's something we've been considering in terms of enrollment, trying to <coughs> promote early enrollment in the agreement. Uh, because there's still that conservation need. I mean, looking at the populations, there's still that need out there in the landscape. They're still being considered for listing. And the window for us now is just this uh, this last point here that by creating on the ground conservation now, uh, before spring of next year, that can get considered as part of the listing decision. And CCA in the past has been used to prevent the listing of species. And I think you know, for everybody that's the best outcome, right? We don't want uh, to do the monarch listing. We want to promote enough voluntary conservation to make that happen and uh, avoid listing altogether. And so the commitment that are made in CCA by enrolling in it to do conservation work will get considered as part of the what we call peace analysis, it's the policy for evaluating conservation efforts. Uh, it's a way in how much conservation is happening on the ground and will that have a positive impact on species. So, okay, where are we with this, all this? Um, so our timeline, I appreciate the back, might be hard to see this. We're, we're right now in sort of the, the limbo period where public comment is done, the service is finalizing a review of that, and uh, as of right now, what we're told is that their internal review will be completed by around the end of October. Which means that once it goes through the final sort of sign off and approvals, it'll be mid to late November. By the time the year is finalized and ready for enrollment. So that's a, that's a big news for us, right? We've been waiting for this for a long time, and uh, it's really exciting to have a date ish that we can shoot for. And, uh, you know, start telling people, get ready to enroll, you know, on and around sort of mid November. So then that window from November to really sort of mid April is what we're calling our early enrollment period. So this is the time when if you enroll early, uh, those <coughs> commitments will get considered for that peak announcement. Even though the listing decision doesn't happen until December, the service, in terms of their staff assessment, the evaluating the service, have to make a cutoff for all that data at some point. That's going to be basically the beginning of May of next year. So in that time from mid-April through December, we're still going to enroll uh, you know, obviously, enroll people in the CCA if they can. It's just that those may or may not be considered as part of, of the, the listing decision at that point. And then, depending on what the listing decision is, if they decide to list the monarch, then you have up to a year for that listing to take into effect. And with the listing taking into effect, um, you know, with seeing a candidate conservation agreement, you can only enroll while that species is a candidate. So once it takes into effect, you can't, you know, enrollment is closed. So there's a lot of time to enroll, but um, really, the, the early enrollment period is really where the, the magic happens. So what do we 
into this new time in this sort of limbo period, uh, we've been doing a few things. The service has been working on reviewing the response to comments. We had hundreds of comments coming on the CCAA, and uh, you know, many supporting, many uh, wanting clarity. Uh, you know, a few, um, you know, not as much in favor of it, but overall, a lot of support, a lot of uh, you know, positive, positive, positive input. Uh, so they're finalizing their response to comments. Uh, they're also doing their, their internal section seven consultation. So verifying that by enrolling in the CCAA and the scope of the conservation measures, the covered activities, which if you're involved with, you have a community list, uh, won't impact or jeopardize, won't jeopardize other listed species. And so at a lower 48 state scale, that's a, that's a big effort. And so the service is working across regions right now to, to finalize that. Um, and then also they've been doing internal briefings within the service and the Department of Interior, um, getting ready for that. Uh, on our side, what we've been working on this, we've been supporting the service through some of those efforts. Uh, we've also been doing our part to get ready for enrollment and sort of program implementation. So part of that is starting off with, uh, you know, as we transition to implementation, we'll have what we call an advisory committee. So sort of a decision-making support body for UIC on behalf of partners to help sort of administer the agreement. Uh, we have bylaws to sort of create, you know, have that governing structure in place once we're in transition. Uh, we have what we call the uh, Monarch CCA Implementation Toolbox that will be on the UIC website where uh, it has various implementation tools and resources that we updated uh, to support applicants and partners in the agreement uh, with Clarifications with templates, uh, examples, those types of things. Uh, we've been refining the application requirements, and so that's still going on while the service is doing their review uh, because those application requirements are driven by them. But we have a uh, you know, information checklist, uh, template out there, those types of things. Uh, the scorecard, so thank you to all of you who came up to the, uh, the scorecard uh, field demo this morning. Uh, the scorecard, while not directly, uh, you know, piece of the CCA is related. The, the tier one of the scorecard was intentionally aligned with the monitoring requirements of the CCAA, so those could be sort of complementary efforts. Um, and then also, you know, tiers two, three would be sort of supplemental monitoring within the context of, of the CCAA. Uh, Eric will talk about that here next. Uh, and last but not least, we can do is continue to outreach the stakeholders. I already mentioned this morning, we've had, you know, 20 plus presentations just since the start of this year around the CCAA and uh, benefits. And we've had a lot of good, a lot of good response. So from here, if you're interested in enrolling, I know a lot of you in the room are already interested in enrolling and are planning on that. Great, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are maybe on the fence or have been thinking about it, there's a good place to start. We have the, uh, the working group website, which has a lot of great resources, the webinars, the Iris mentioned, there's frequently asked questions, uh, talking points to share internally with others in your organization. Uh, and we also have a cost benefit analysis that we've gone through with several partners to just demonstrate, you know, from a business case standpoint, what's the, the financial benefit of enrollment. Uh, supporting UIC during phase three, so uh, you know, UIC has been asking for, for additional funding support as the phase three is sort of dragging out longer. Uh, sorry, dragging, but this extended longer than we had planned on, and so you know. Helping us to do that work for implementation in the meantime until the program is up and running. Um, and so, Iris, I'm sure we have to talk more about that if you're interested. And then, last but not least, you know, talk to Iris, talk to me. Uh, happy to talk over some pre application needs and considerations there. I've already talked with you about different questions you've had. Um, you know, happy, to, happy to answer those. Why would you want to enroll early? I talked about that, that sort of early enrollment period. Uh, you know, there's, there's Regulatory benefits of getting those commitments acknowledged by the service as part of their, their listing decision. So that's a huge benefit. There's also chance to be a leader, right? You're all here because you care about habitat in your right ways and you're trying to do something to improve on it. And the CPA is a way to you know help hopefully motivate and spur change within your organization to make that happen. So uh, being a leader as part of that early on uh, you know, helps me kind of demonstrate those commitments and uh, we think it's a low risk way of sort of committing to Conservation improvement. Uh, also, there is a uh, reduced administrative fee if you're enrolling before the end of that early enrollment period. So, by the end of April 15th of next year. 
uh, sorry to fairly roll it though. We've been looking over our notes and kind of comparing where we're at in terms of uh, committed and interested applicants. So on the right, we have our committed applicants. These are uh, organizations that have already submitted a letter of commitment that they are uh, planning on when the agreement's available, they're going to enroll in the CCAA. And so right now we have 16 that have provided that letter. And uh, you know, it's split a little bit more on the transportation side than energy, but roughly half, half and half. Uh, we also, Iris and I have been going through and having a lot of conversations, and we have a pool of what we call our interested applicants. These are organizations that haven't sent up a, a letter saying that they're going to enroll yet, but they've been going through calculating the ages and asking detailed questions about uh, implementation. Uh, they've had their fees calculated. Um, so they've done everything but in the letter, but they're by all means making uh, strong efforts towards enrolling in the agreement. And we have another 35 there that are, are showing signs of enrolling. So together we have over 50 potential partners already that are going to be enrolled in the agreement, which is huge. It's, it's a great uh, start to, to something like this. So we're really happy to see that level of interest. And uh, again, if you're not considering enrolling yet, hopefully you see this doing so. So yeah, if you are interested, we hope you flock to the CCA like monarchs on the phone route during migration. <laughs> so review the draft CCAA with supporting webinars is a good first step if you've done that. Uh, estimating what those commitments are. So uh, within the year we have enrolled lands, which then you calculate your adopted acres commitments off of that. So figuring out those numbers estimates is, a, is an important next step. Uh, you can use the On Your Habitat scorecard also to familiar, familiarize yourself with what's out there in the system and how it might be managed. Um, so give you some on-the-ground benefits there to start using that scorecard as part of this. And then, like I said, reach out to UIC for uh, free application needs. And so, as we're getting to close, I want to share this. I shared this quote before the past meeting, but okay. I'm from Wisconsin, and so you know we all hail our conservation heritage of Muir, Leopold, and Nelson. And uh, so I can't put the Leopold quote before. But I like this because he was writing about uh, recreational leases and planning back in the 30s. And basically, the, the crux of all conservation problems is that everybody's a steward of, of two interests. Not only the ethical, right? The public interest and their own. And then you need a positive use and reward for so you can respect both of those interests in their practice and what they do. He says all conservation problems come down to this. And he goes on in this to say that the, the solution to this, the solution to solving these problems is through collaboration, through dialogue, through working together to find the solutions that work. And I really think the CCAA, at the end of the day, is you know, one of the most current and best examples we have of that. I mean, Hey, let's face it, we have a world that is, you know, politically divided, you know, opinions reach all over the place on any, any number of topics and issues. And here in the past year and a half, we've had 40 plus partners get together so with different opinions and they've been able to compromise and collaborate and, uh, you know, create this agreement, this nationwide <laughs> conservation agreement for voluntary, you know, uh, conservation monarchs. It's, it's a big deal. Uh, it's bigger than just monarchs and monarchs. So with that, thank you to all those partners, all those advisory team members who have committed to the development of this, who've been involved with all the nitty-gritty details that we've worked through, who've uh, spent hours and uh, you know, time and resources to make this happen. Uh, we really, really couldn't do it without you. Um, with that, if we have time, uh, I give you a couple questions. Thank you.
hearing an update on the pollinator scorecard. Those of you who are at the field demonstration this morning got to experience it. Uh, but we, we want to give a shout out and a big thank you to Eric Anderson, who will be speaking next, and to the technical team for the huge list that they, that they had um, to finalize the, the scorecard by this summer. And uh, Eric is going to give you an overview. Eric Anderson is a senior associate at Environmental Incentives. And uh, please welcome him up. to be here. Um, this was a really fun project to work on. Um, so yeah, I just want to give you a quick uh, introduction to the, the Pollinator Scorecard. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, you know, recognize the, the other members on the technical team. I was part of a, uh, you know, a, a really great team to put this together, including Monarch Joint Venture, um, Hans Scott from Penn State, Cardinal, Wildlife Habitat Council, and of course, Iris and her great team at UIC. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize the sponsors that made this happen. We couldn't have gotten to this point, especially on the time frame, without your help. So, um, you know, big shout out and thank you to all our sponsors. Um, and next, I want to thank anyone who's had a chance to actually use Pollinator Scorecard on the right of way. You know we're not really fans of raising our hands here, but just by show of hands, <laughs> who has been able to use the Pollinator Scorecard on the right of way? Great. Thank you. And who was at the training this morning? Thanks. So, uh, apologies to those who have uh, already heard this spiel. Um, I'm going to be brief and hopefully save a little time for questions. But uh, basically, today I just want to give you a quick overview of the scorecard and um, and, then, and then answer some questions. So, you know, the, I think this group was really insightful to re recognize the need for this tool. Um, you know, pollinator scorecard, some standardized approach to actually evaluating pollinator habitat on rights of way. So the question is, you know, why develop the pollinator scorecard? So the purpose of the pollinator scorecard is to provide a common language for us to talk about habitat um, on energy and transportation land. So that's going to allow us to, uh, to collaborate. Um, it's a consistent evaluation method across right of way sectors. Right. So this is important because now when we go out, we're all doing the same thing and speaking the same language. The other important factor of the volume scorecard is it's multi-tier. So we recognize that um, not everybody's going to be needing the pollinator scorecard for the exact same thing. Um, so we need to allow different users from different backgrounds with different needs to be able to use the scorecard. And finally, um, what we're really excited about is how this is going to facilitate shared reporting. So, you know, maybe when we get back together around this time next year, we'll have data from a, a bunch of different rights of way that we can compare. We can talk about what management actions are working, what's not working, what we have out there. So the first step in this process is to understand what pollinator habitat is. So um, first thing we did was just define pollinator habitat. So for the purposes of the scorecard, pollinator habitat contains native flowering plants host plants and nesting sites and throughout the growing season. A couple other things to note. Um, pollinator habitat, habitat can be uh, remnant natural habitat, it can be enhanced through management, or it can be newly created habitat. The importance of flowering plants is they provide nectar and pollen to pollinators. And typically a greater diversity or dominance by native plants provides a greater diversity of floral resources, host plants, and nesting sites. So I know the uh, concept of native plants can be a little bit tricky. Um, you know, we have different definitions for what's native, what's invasive, what's not native. But typically, the reason we're focusing on native plants is that when we manage for native plants, you know, those plants adapted in the region of climate um, that we're working in, and they're just going to provide better resources for pollinators they're going to be more resilient. Finally, we're going to aim for three or more of those native plant species throughout each of spring, summer, and fall. So I'm just going to walk through kind of the three primary uses of the pollinator scorecard. 
Um, the first is assessing habitat quality. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we can go out there, we can inventory our habitat. Uh, we can go out there and we can identify where those habitats are particularly high quality. And we can also watch those habitats through time and determine where our management actions are improving or where those threats on engagement right away are impacting our habitat quality. Second, we can use the pollinator scorecard to inform management decisions. Um, so part of the pollinator scorecard is a management module, which we'll talk about in a second. But that allows us, when we go out there, to identify opportunities, identify threats, and then identify how well our management is mitigating for those threats or taking advantage of those opportunities. And again, so looking at that habitat quality over time, we can evaluate how that management is contributing to pollinator habitat in a right of way. The third primary use is to support communication and learning. And this is where having that standardized approach, um, that protocol that we're all using, that common definition of pollinator habitat really comes into play. So we can, with the standard protocol, compare those habitat qualities, maybe from this right of way or this site to that site, maybe across regions, maybe between organizations. When we talk to each other about pollinator habitat, we have these shared metrics that provide that common <laughs> language. And then when we get back together, we can figure out where we have gaps, where we need to do more research and do more monitoring to understand um, how our pollinator habitat is responding to management. So who uses the pollinator scorecard? When we first started, um, we kind of understood that we have different users out there, and we need to be able to meet the needs of all of our users. So we kind of went through a fun exercise to try and understand who those users might be. And in doing that, we kind of uh, categorized our users into these, these three different um, categories. The first being the wing tips. So these are our uh, compliance managers, the you know, folks that were really worried about regulations. Next being the field toes, so these are right to way managers focused on vegetation out there managing those contracts. Um, and then finally, the Kiva, so our natural resources managers, those folks that they have a botany background, have a little bit more experience in monitoring. And, you know, as you look across the spectrum of users, it's pretty obvious that we need to have um, slightly different tools for each. So for our Kivas that are out there that really want to go through and do that species list, that want to um, figure out every pollinator um, that, that they see on the site, we have the third tier. Um, and then for those folks that really just need to get out there and inventory their right of way so they can enroll in the CTAA, for example, um, we have lower tiers for that as well. So just a little bit more on the tiers. Uh, tier one is that really basic habitat determination. It's basically yes and no. Do I have habitat in this particular site or not? Or we're, we're really just looking at whether there's blooming extra plants out there. And then we're also looking at hill seeds. And again, that's tied to the CTAA, so that's why we're looking at those two things. There are a few optional um, categories to extend tier one. Tier two um, is really about habitat quality. So for those of you who are out there this morning, that's kind of what we went through. Uh, gives you a qualitative assessment of what the habitat quality is. Uh, finally, with tier three, you're getting the species list, you're looking at not just weeds, um, you're getting just a little bit more detail uh, that can help you make management decisions. So, um, at its core, the pollinator scorecard is really just two components. One is the assessment. Uh, so, we have a field data sheet. We also have a survey one, two, three app, which is pretty cool. Um, We'll hear a little bit more about that later. And that's where we're going to go out on the site. We're going to fill that out for each plot. Uh, we might do multiple plots per site. Uh, the second component then is the management module. So this is going to allow us to, from the site information, identify the threats and opportunities, and then determine how well our management uh, is meeting the opportunities on the site. And it also suggests some additional best management practices for that particular. So the scorecard can be used anywhere. You can use it on any of your rights of way, any of your facilities, your sites, um, around your corporate campuses. Um, it, it's 
kind of up to you. Uh, this map here kind of illustrates some of the different concepts. Um, so we have the management area, right? So that's where you have uh, maybe a management description or you're using IBM, and that's where we're going to apply the management module. And then we have plots, which are our small 1,500 square foot, so about 150 feet long areas that we're going to actually be assessing. Um, that's what we went through today. And then the sites are the broader area that we're characterizing with those plots. Um, generally, we would say, you know, do as many plots as you can, given the resource constraints. The more plots, the better. In terms of when the scorecard should be used, uh, typically we're looking for this to be done in a single visit. So it doesn't require multiple visits for a year. Um, that you know, when we're looking at extra plants, we know that there's different phenologies, and so we recognize that um, you know a single visit may not give you the best characterization of the site, and that's why we're looking at not just the plants that are flowering now, but the plants that may be flowering or are recently flowered. That extends our window a little bit into the quality of that site. It's recommended that you go during peak uh, blooming season, so typically in the summer, early fall. Um, and you collect that information again for all potentially flowering extra plants. So now that we have this tool, what does it look like for us all to use it? You know, our vision of success is that our vegetation managers are out there adopting best management practices to improve pollinator habitat in right way. This is really what it comes down to. Right? Are we getting more and more pollinator habitat and higher and higher quality on the right way? And are we increasing our collaboration and meaningful communication uh, among right of way managers and other organizations on pollinator habitat? And do you guys have a greater understanding of what uh, pollinator habitat is and what high quality pollinator habitat is? Are you able to communicate that within your organization and to your contractors? And finally, you know, do we have widespread adoption of a consistent monitoring? Um, that's going to give us a great data set to start asking questions about, and answering our questions, and uh, seeing our progress through time. So, looking forward, um, you know, we're really excited to have this version 1.0 1 out, 1 out to you guys. Um, we're looking forward to you guys actually uh, picking it up and using it in 2020. Um, as Dan just pointed out, Tier 1. Is a, is a good opportunity to get out there and do some inventory, uh, understand where you have pollinator habitat on your right of way, start thinking about maybe using it for the TTAA, um, and using two, uh, tier two or tier three can count towards that supplemental monitoring activity. Uh, the geospatial habitat database, which we'll hear about next, um, is available, and there's a survey one, two, three app, so if you prefer not to do the paper data sheets, you can use the survey one, two, three app, and that data will automatically get uploaded to the database. And then finally, um, we're, we're looking forward to 2020 to thinking about how we can improve the scorecard, getting your feedback, um, providing some training. So you, you might look forward to a spring training um, or a metric target task force meeting so we can start thinking about how to use the scorecard to set targets and track our progress towards those targets. And then finally, you know, when we get back here together in the fall, um, it would be great to have, you know, an agenda item dedicated to sharing some data, um, understanding where we have pollinator habitat, how much pollinator habitat, and what sorts of management actions are really promoting pollinator habitat into our right of way. So I've been talking to a few of you throughout the day about uh, your experiences with the scorecard. I really encourage you guys to come up and find me or anyone else on the team. Um, let us know how you envision using the scorecard, uh, how the scorecard support, can support your programs, um, and then how we can continue to help you guys use the scorecard. So that's all I have, uh, but I'll take questions. We have time. Eric, you might have already mentioned this, and forgive me if you have. Um, this morning we had some discussions and feedback. There were some uh, 
Companies that were expressed the potential uh, small improvements or changes or enhancements. Um, moving forward, what's the next step with the uh, historic part? What can we expect uh, once it's finalized? Uh, okay, thanks for that question. Um, so, you know, one of the things specifically that we're talking about this morning is how uh, the qualitative rankings of different uh, habitat qualities seem to uh, provide a little too high of a ranking for some of the habitats that um, you guys are seeing on your right away. So, you know, when we put those together, we used the little bit of data we had to calibrate that. And I think kudos to you guys for having you know, really great habitat out on those right away. So, that's something we'd like to look at is how we can make those categories a little more reflective of the habitat qualities we're seeing on right away. Uh, in terms of how we'd actually make those changes, I think that's yet to be seen. Um, I'm sure Iris can answer that question as well, but possibly in the spring or uh, later this year, getting back together with the technical team and the metrics, uh, the metrics task force uh, to determine, you know, what kind of feedback we've received so far and how we can integrate that into the short time. Sure. Um, can we collect and submit data from Canada? Absolutely. I like your that. Uh, and number two is um, when we're talking about making these adjustments in the future, do you think there'd be any value in having some sort of dedicated mailbox or something that we could, you know, submit these kind of requests to functional requests as we move to the country? That's a great idea. Um, and we kind of talked about having a, a, an email address that you can send uh, feedback to. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll set something up similar to that unless you know where you can direct that feedback. So with some of the states establishing certification programs in, in other metrics that they're using, how are you incorporating incorporating that or not into the scorecard? And so we know some of the states are um, you know, developing solar scorecard requiring calling their habitat on, on solar sites. Um, you know, we recognize that there are a lot of tools out there. So, you know, when thinking about a tool, make sure you're using the most appropriate one. Um, I've heard some folks are planning to use both the pollinator scorecard and state solar scorecard. Uh, I don't know if we have any plans to use the pollinator scorecard specifically for uh, the state uh, in that same way. But uh, yeah, just consider kind of what your requirements are and what the most appropriate monitoring protocol is. Uh, we have time for one more question. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eric. Next, I would like to invite up our GIS rock stars. Um, our, we will uh, be giving an update on the geospatial habitat database. Mark Johnson, the GIS manager and conservation ecologist for the Telescience Action Center at the Seattle <coughs> Museum, and Karen Klinger, the GIS specialist, uh, has developed the citizen schema and works well for the geospatial habitat site. Please welcome the room. I think we're ready. Um, so, such a great opportunity this morning to be able to go outside and, and actually go on right away. Thanks to um, Ohio DOT to be able to provide that opportunity to us. And then it was great you know, for the folks who are hopefully a bunch of you were able to download the Survey123 app and try it out. Um, for the folks that were able to do that, the system that we're going to be talking about with this uh, right to a database system. It'll be essentially identical to that, um, to that extent when you're using the Survey123. So if you decide to have your field workers uh, collect their data through the app that, uh, that we're providing, it'll be identical through this system. So we're going to walk through some of the updates from that and uh, show you kind of where we are with the database. Okay. Um, so we have 
So we kind of uh, we kind of threw them for a loop here because we're trying to do a, a portion of this is going to have a live portion wanting to show the results from survey one two three. And as a result, we had to switch for vendor mode switching the computer. So this is a, this is all on that. <laughs> Okay, so just quickly, uh, this is a brief outline on the different things we're going to be talking about this one or this afternoon. If you um, so we're looking at uh, kind of an overview and status of the database system, uh, setting up an account. So should you choose to, to jump on board now, we, we're going to walk you through what that process looks like. And how to use the database uh, in terms of both the data capture, data import, uh, analysis, sharing, and collaboration. And then kind of what our next steps are and then what your next steps are as well as you decide to jump on board. And so this kind of just talking briefly about the purpose of the database. Uh, so it's a central repository for tracking habitat and management activities, uh, for facilitating conservation collaborations and partnerships, for communicating with stakeholders and the public, uh, for it's a reporting mechanism to support the CCA <laughs> compliance and also the MCD that we were just talking about earlier. Um, and it's also a data collection system with ready-to-use field applications. Maybe another such with kind of some of you are trying out this morning. Uh, the status of the database. So the database is operational right now. So if you're interested, we're looking for more uh, beta testers to jump on board and begin trying it out. Um, it has a customized secure access to share to shared database. What we mean by that is that once the account is established, you can log in. You're going to have your own secure environment where you're uploading your data. And you make a decision if you want to share your data and how much of the data you want to share. What the different uh, fields are that you want to share, what level. We'll go through that in a minute. Uh, there's a uh, data sharing, as I mentioned, to, facility, to facilitate collaborations, uh, field data collection tools, that's survey one, two, three, and also collector. So if you, um, probably a lot of you have used uh, survey one, two, three, and collector or work collector. Um, collector allows you to collect polygons, the boundaries, so you can sort of in the field uh, mark where those locations are of your site and, and what the shape of them are. And then in development right now, we have a, we're, we're putting together the next couple of weeks, we'll have a landing page uh, for the database. Um, so right now, there's kind of an informational page. Some of you may have seen that through the Right Good Way to Habitat Working Group website. If you go back there in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have links there. For lots of information about the database, the structure of the database, guidelines for using it, and uh, of course how to sign up and, and log in to begin creating your own account. Um, in addition to that, there's, we're working on developing a public and private dashboard for reporting. So on the public side, we'll have at the county level, we'll be reporting out information about what data is in the system. And then at the private level, you'll be able to see reporting information specific to your organization. Um, Geoprocessing tools for importing and for analysis or also development. And currently we have about 10 organizations that have come forward. Uh, about eight of those are physically we have um, accounts built out for them right now in the database. And we're ready for more to join. So contact us um, if you're interested in uh, give information about that. Here you go right here. So setting up an account, how do you do that? Um, so this, there's a tiny URL here. If you want to take a picture of this, you can write this down. Um, this will give you an idea. So basically, the, you want your account manager or, or people who can help to make decisions about whether you give a shared data or not. That, that's the person who should be filling this out. And um, after you filled out this, this sheet, and we'll kind of show a little bit of what that looks like, we then go through the process of what we call deploying your organization. And basically that means that it creates the back end in the database, uh, creates the account for you. And 
part of what will happen is the manager and field worker groups will be created. We'll sort of show what that looks like. Um, uh, the, the maps and field applications are enabled for you to begin using that. So like survey one, two, three. And user accounts are established. And so that can also be for um, field workers if you choose to go that route or you can also upload data at the end of your field season. Uh, and then we like to meet with organizations, kind of do a quick over the phone, one-on-one, -on -one, get an idea of how you want to use the database system, and make sure it's, it's meeting your needs as well, and to demonstrate how it works. <coughs> okay, so this is the, um, the intake questionnaire, and um, this is the beginning uh, portion of the questionnaire, and so you need to fill out what your organization name is, of course. But we also have, we ask for like a short name for your organization that's almost like a ticker symbol. And basically that's used to associate with every piece of data that you enter into the system. And that's how we keep it secure. You know, everyone, every data that's entered in is, is unique to your organization. Um, so that's important to have that. And then you identify an account admin. And that's going to be, again, the person who can kind of make decisions on the sharing levels for your organization. And then a, a data manager, that's uh, typically like a GIS person who um, has good information and you can have more than one. You know, you know um, how to do uploading of data and can kind of help with managing GIS data. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have sort of, we asked some questions about are you collecting data this year? Um, are you planning on using your own system, maybe through a, uh, um, a uh, contractor or, or in-house? or do you want to use the system that we put out? Um, so those are all options. And then uh, whether you have any field staff, if you do want to use the system with the uh, survey one, two, three that we've designed, then you can sort of fill out the box portion here of who those users are, what their, um, what their RTS online uh, account names are, if they have those, um, all that optional information there. And then um, let's see what else that is. Uh, so yeah, you can identify your field staff and then um, data sharing levels. So this is important where um, you can indicate, you know, if you want to share center lines and a lot of organizations don't. So we, we have that by default turned off and then there's management areas, sites, and pollinator scorecard information. All of that, of course, if you provide that information, it's super helpful for, um, for collaborations with other organizations. And, okay, so after we deploy the organization, this is uh, RTS Online, so this is mostly be what your data manager folks uh, would see. Um, so they would log into the system, and this is showing for UIC if that's the, or actually ERC within UIC. If that was the organization that was deployed, you'd see two, um, these sort of two options down here, a field work group and a management group. The field work group is, is where you're going to see that survey one, two, three, and collector. And it's going to have a, um, a streamlined uh, information just about the fields that those people need to fill out in the field. And then the management group is more for the GIS folks to log in and be able to do data uploads and have kind of the full spectrum of the data that's available for them. And then in addition, there's a data, there's a demo field work group, and that's really just for sort of testing out the system and trying it out. And then, so just if you were to go into, as an example, the field worker group, these are four of the objects that you there. The one on the left is going to be the scorecard, and the one on the far right is, is your collector um, type interface, the web map that you can use to collect your field. This is more again for GIS folks, but in the middle there are the rest endpoints. And those are things that GIS folks can actually pull into things like uh, ArcGIS and our Pro and begin to upload data directly into the database. Um, so if you already have your own system, you're collecting data, you can upload it in. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, so as we mentioned, one of the ways that you can capture data for the database system is using your own system or your contractor system. But if you are doing that, we actually make it easy by providing the schema of our database so that when it is time to import your data into our database, it runs smoothly. So this basically outlines the different field names that are in our database and gives you those specifications like the data type and length. So once again, the transmission from what your data to our data makes it smooth. Um, so on the left, you'll see an Excel spreadsheet so it walks through each of the feature classes. As you saw, there's central lines, management areas, site, and the pollinator scorecard. 
Um, and then we also have a file G database as well as a guidance document that goes through and explains what each of those um, fields are and also the domain options. So we still have those options to do drop down. And as Mark mentioned, we also provide field applications for you to use through our system. Um, one of those being collected for ArcGIS. So this is primarily used for collecting site boundaries, for example, for the sites and also for mansion areas, which Eric showed. And so these can be tied to your pollinator scorecard points. So you can use these to track the conservation measures and management actions that you're performing on the site. So you can kind of tie that into how it's doing in terms of the habitat quality. We also have the Pawnee Scorecard app, which many of you played with before this morning um, through Survey 123. And what's neat, as you saw, is that it is dynamic. It lets you select the survey tier that you are using. So if you select Tier 1, then you will see those fields that are relevant to Tier 1. Same with Tier 2 and Tier 3. So you're only seeing the fields that you need to see. It lets you collect your GPS data, fill in all the required fields, and also fill in all the fields with the point values. And what's neat about that is that as you're going through and entering those point values, it is total for you and giving you the have tech quality rating based on that point system. Uh, there's also the fields to add in your management uh, threats and opportunities. And so for your field workers, they're basically just going to have the app. They're going to log in using the login, as Mark mentioned, with their field stuff, and they'll download the app right through there. So they don't even have to go online. It's all through the app. And now I'm going to attempt to do a lot of them. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is some of the data that was collected this morning. So here's uh, some of the pictures that were collected. So this is uh, through the demo. This is sort of separate from the database just to give you an idea of how the scorecard looks in Survey 123. And if we take a look at the map, we can see this is the site where we were at. And we can click on one of these points and get the information and how it would appear um, with all of your information that you entered through all the drop down options. And we can also go ahead and see all the pictures that were taken. So this ties it all together and it's another option for the instead of doing the piece work. <laughs> that, I'll turn it back over to Mark. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to walk through briefly about some other data import options. So, I know a lot of folks have said, well, we already have our own system, but we're using the Class Data, or we're working with contractors that have the you know, Survey 123 um, already incorporating the systems that we're using. Um, so, this is a method where you can go and upload data to the system at the end of your field season or periodically throughout. And so we've got three options for this. The first two are implemented. The third one is, is uh, something we're still developing. But the first one would be to take uh, what Karen is describing earlier, that, that template geodatabase, and your GIS folks can simply take the data that you've been collecting, match the fields using a data loader tool, and just transfer the data over and simply send that to us and we can um, directly import it. Um, that's kind of the, the sort of more manual method. The, the second method, ArcGIS Pro, and unfortunately not ArcMap, but ArcGIS Pro um, is sort of the newer version that Esri is supporting for, for GIS folks to use. If, you're, if your GIS team is using that, they can actually just pull that REST endpoint. It's just a connection to the database directly into their, into their desktop application. And then you can you can import the data directly into the database that way. There's no need to like send us anything. You can do it. You can manage the data directly yourself, um, because that's ideal if you're managing the data and seeing what what is actually in the database yourself. And then the third option is this online web interface, and that's uh, through a web app builder. Um, basically, these are geoprocessing tools that are incorporated into a website. And what that means is there's um, a couple of different tools that you can run. This one would be uh, geared towards specifically importing your data, so you're matching up your fields with our fields, and that's another way to transfer the data over. And so that's all through an online interface. Um, and then we want to show you other things that can be done once you're, once you're starting to work with your data. If you upload things like center lines, 
Um, and this is, we haven't uh, released this yet, but we've worked on this tool. Um, but this is where you can take your center lines and, and buffer out and estimate where um, where the uh, management areas may be. And then once you have management areas, you can overlay like the N NCLB or LCD, the National Line Cover Data Set, and begin to see like roughly estimate what, what do you think is actually in that those habitat areas. Is it agriculture or is it something that might be more amenable to, to actually getting conservation work in? That's the land cover characterization. And then with the power model um, from HEC, uh, that's something that we can um, take the, uh, the actual coefficients and estimate you know, what the amount of, um, of milkweed is present there or the, the um, potential for that habitat. And that's, that's at a pre course level, so you're using that system, but it's a way to at least begin to, to look at what your opportunities are and estimate. Uh, and then other things that you can do is uh, share the data, of course. So that's what we want to hugely promote, is the idea that you can take your data and if for the GIS folks, they can have access, if it's been provided, um, to see where your rights-of-way intersect with other rights-of-way organizations. It should be some collaborative work that way. And also to look at like our, the protected lands that are nearby that you, you might be able to link to through your, through your own right-of-way. To provide habitat as kind of a corridor linking those areas together. Um, that's about it. Okay, and then for data sharing, we want to go into this a little more explicitly. So, in the middle here, um, so your organization will have, if you um, are enrolled in the database, you have sites, you have management areas, center lines, and then those polling scorecard <coughs> points. And for each one of those layers, you can go through and decide do I want to share? at a basic level with all organizations uh, for, for one or more of those. So we'd like to encourage that maybe you share your sites and management areas with all organizations, if that's possible. Um, you can also do detailed sharing. Maybe some of the departments of transportation are willing to allow more fields. So we have, um, so this is part of the information that will be on the website about what are those fields that are exposed um, at the basic level and at the, the more detailed level. <laughs> and then you can you can also uh, instead of sharing with all organizations, you can explicitly decide. This is the lower right box here. Um, uh, explicitly decide to share with a particular organization or, or a host of organizations. Um, and then finally, on the, the left here is the idea of um, so by enrolling in the database, you are expected to be able to share with the public at a countywide scale. So we'll show in the next slide um, how that's done. So this is this is uh, still in development, but this is a, a prototype of a dashboard, and obviously just showing Illinois in this case. But um, where we've taken all the rights of way information by county and estimate and, and been able to then calculate out what is the total amount of acreage within each county um, to, uh, to to see how much habitat we have in management areas and in sites, and then there's a lot of other metrics. Um, okay, so finally, next steps. So for us, uh, we have the informational website that's, that's on the Rice and Grace Habitat um, website, and I'll have all the information about the website or about the database in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we have um, the, the public and private dashboards that we're developing, the geoprocessing tools that I mentioned. And then for you, if you're interested, you can go ahead and begin taking a look at the um, the questionnaire, the intake questionnaire, fill that out, um, or get in contact with Karen and I to, to get more information about the system. And then if you're already participating for the same uh, organization you mentioned earlier, we encourage you to upload your data, and especially uh, if you do have polygons to go with your sites or management areas, that will help us to develop the, that uh, public dashboard as well to have more data to work with to see you know, what the possibilities are. That's it.